Lissa Productions. Okay. Welcome back to Experimental Physics. Today we begin a series of investigations on the harmonic oscillator. The goal of these investigations is to measure the motion of a mass on a spring under various conditions. We'll begin today with an investigation of free oscillations. So just a quick recap of the key points of the theory and then we'll get into the details of the measurements that you'll need to make. The first assumption is that there is no energy loss. That is to say, when we stretch the spring, the energy put into the system by the stretching the spring comes back completely in the form of kinetic energy of the moving mass. And the energy simply sloshes back and forth between potential energy and kinetic energy. So no energy loss. The second assumption is that the springs obey Hooke's law which is to say that the force exerted by the spring is directly proportional to the amount of stretch of the spring. And there's a minus sign to indicate that the direction of the force is opposite to the direction of the displacement. Finally, we assume that Newton's second law of motion applies to this situation. That is to say that the net force on the system is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Yes. So this assumption is one that we can trust. It's these two assumptions that I invite you to challenge by making appropriate measurements. So, if we make all of these assumptions, no energy loss, Hooke's law describing the behavior of the springs, and Newton's law describing the motion of the system, what we get is a period for the mass spring system that's related only to the mass and to the spring constant, according to the equation T equals 2 pi root m over k. So if we change the mass of the system, the period will change. But let me pause right now and uh, call to your attention the fact that the system is not oscillating with quite the same amplitude that it started when I set the system in motion. That suggests already that maybe there is some energy loss. But the question is, is it enough energy loss to make this equation no longer valid? So what we're trying to do in all of our experiments in the course is to make measurements as precisely as we possibly can to push the theory to the limit and see where it begins to break down. So we'll investigate this behavior uh, in our series of experiments today on the free oscillations. So we're using a linear air track which serves two purposes. It constrains the mass to oscillate in one dimension and it also does a pretty good job of removing the friction from the system by allowing the object to ride on a cushion of air. The system consists of a large mass connected by springs to fixed ends on the track. And what you want to do first of all is to determine the mass of the system as precisely as you think you can. So we'll use a digital analytical balance to measure the mass of the system. You can just unclip the clips and the springs, record the mass. You might want also to check to be sure that the measurements are reproducible. So put the glider on the balance a couple of times and check for reproducibility. But is that all you really need? Notice that when the springs are attached, what's moving is not just the glider. Certainly the clips that attach the springs are also moving and the springs are moving as well. So this portion of the spring is moving about as much as the glider, but this end of the spring is not moving. So what you'll need to do is to discuss with your lab partners how much of the spring mass you need to take into account in order to determine the entire mass of the system. If you neglect the mass of the springs, you'll be making a systematic error in the low direction. But if you include the mass of all of the springs, you'll be overestimating the mass. So think carefully about how much of the spring mass should be included in the total mass of the system. The next thing that you'll need to do is to determine the spring constant. How strong are these springs? 
Each of the setups has a box of accessories. And one of these is a pulley, so we just attach a pulley to the end of the track. And a mass hanging device over the pulley attached to the glider. And first of all, you want to carefully measure the position of the glider with no hanging force attached. Then attach the hanger to the glider and run it over the pulley. And the force of gravity on this hanging mass applies tension to the string. The tension in the string pulls on the system and displaces the mass a little bit. So you carefully measure the amount of displacement relative to where it was in equilibrium and record the force, which is to say the force of gravity times the mass, and record the displacement and we'll plot a graph of the force uh, against the displacement to determine the spring constant. So to vary the force, we have a number of masses. These little brass discs are the ones that you should use. And one by one, you just hang a little more mass on the hanger, record the new position, and add a little more mass, and so forth. So use as many different combinations of these as you can to get uh, a good variety of mass measurements. But one thing to be aware of, if you apply too much force, watch what happens to the springs. So be careful that the amount of hanging mass is not so much that it causes these springs to completely collapse. Then they're no longer participating in the force on the system. So the range of masses that you use needs to be within the range where all of the springs are participating in the force on the system. If you take a look at these masses, they have the manufacturer's mass stamped on them, but never believe that. I'd like you to measure the mass individually for each of them, put it on the analytical balance, and uh, actually check and make an independent measurement of what the mass is for each of these things. So don't just be satisfied with the number that happens to be stamped on there. There could be dirt or tape or fingerprints or uh, other things that change what the actual mass is. So measure it independently for each of the combinations. That gives you the information that you need to determine the strength of the springs, the, uh, the Hooke's Law spring constant. So you've measured the mass of the system paying attention to the amount of spring mass that you want to include in the total of uh, the mass of the system. And you carefully determine the spring constant. And from this information, you can then calculate what the predicted period should be. Finally, we want to measure the period. So I'll just slide the accessories out of the way and bring in a photo gate timing device. So this system enables you to measure the period. There is a an infrared photodiode and a phototransistor that measures the light coming across this little beam. What you want to do is adjust the height of the gate. It slides up and down on this post. Adjust the height of the gate so that the light beam is interrupted by the little peg on top of the glider and you'll see that it's in the right position when the little peg passes through the gates there's a little blinking light at the top indicating that it's working. Now the photo gate timer has a number of functions. You want to set it to the pendulum mode so when you come into the lab the device will probably be switched off 
just push the function switch all the way to the top to the pendulum mode. What this does is to trigger the photo gate when the little peg passes through it the first time. It ignores the second interruption on the way back and it stops timing on the third interruption. That gives you the time for one complete cycle of oscillation, which is the period of the motion. So set it to the pendulum mode. Uh, this particular model is the newest one in the collection and when you turn it on, it's ready to go without any further adjustments. We have an older model in the collection, so some of you will have this model, which has a resolution switch as well as a function switch. Be sure to set the resolution switch to a tenth of a millisecond. We want to be able to measure the period as precisely as possible and these timers are capable of measuring with a resolution of a tenth of a millisecond. So set the resolution switch to 0 0.1 millisecond before you begin to measure. Then what we do is displace the glider, again being careful not to collapse the springs. You want the springs to be fully participating in the force in the system. Just pull the glider back completely out of the photo gate. Press the reset button on the timer and let it go. And this particular period is about 0 .86, uh, 0 0.86 seconds. So stop the glider and hit the reset button. Start it again. Make another measurement. And stop the system and just repeat uh, about 10 times. Get a good distribution of measurements and then we can calculate the mean and the standard deviation and the error on the mean of the set of measurements. So you measure the period directly with the photo gate timer compare the experimental measurement to the prediction that you made based on the spring constant and the mass of the system. Then finally we'll do this uh, set of measurements all over again, first by changing the mass of the system. So in your box of accessories there are some silvery color, these are actually nickel plated brass but that's not relevant. You take a couple of these extra masses and load them onto the posts on the glider and there's a corresponding one on the back side to keep it balanced. So add some extra mass. You don't have to re-measure the spring constant. That depends only on the configuration of the spring. So leave that as it is. Change the amount of mass and we'll notice now that the period is increased significantly with the amount of mass added to the system. So repeat the measurements with an increased amount of mass and then do that yet another time by adding more mass onto the system, an extra one. So this uh, total added mass roughly doubles the mass of this system. Then just uh, make another set of period measurements with the increased mass. So that will give you three different sets of measurements for three different masses but the same spring constant. Then what we'll do is remove the extra masses, set those aside. And now we're going to change the spring constant. So to do that, we'll just unhook one of the springs, just remove it completely from the system. That's something that's easy to happen. And we just reattach the system. So now we've got three springs instead of four. So removing one of the springs from the system changes the force constant of the combined system and you'll have to remeasure that. So this is a new Hooke's law spring constant and you simply reattach the mass hanger run that over the pulley and once again make as many combinations of force 
applied by the hanging masses on the end of the string as a function of the displacement of the glider, plot that again and determine the new spring constant. Then remove the hanging mass and repeat the period measurements. So you have a new set of period measurements for the new spring constant, but now with the original mass, just uh, no additional mass. The final set of measurements is to change the spring constant once more. So we will remove the spring at the other end. And now that's uh, obviously a very different period because the spring constant has changed significantly. So once again, remeasure the force constant, attach the hanging masses to the system and determine what this new spring constant is. In the end, what you'll have is five different combinations of mass and spring constant. And we'll plot the data in such a way that we can determine whether the actual measured period really does vary as the square root of the mass divided by the square root of the spring constant. So just to recap the measurements that you're going to make and the thinking that you have to do about the free oscillations, you measure the mass of the system as carefully as you possibly can, taking into account how much mass the springs contribute to the system. We determine the spring constant by carefully measuring the displacement of the system as a function of the force applied and see if we really do have a linear relationship between force and displacement for the spring constant. And then we put all the ingredients together and predict the period, then measure the period carefully with a precise timing device and see if the period really does vary as the square root of the mass over the spring constant.